Hello everyone and welcome to STEM Fest 2015. My name is Bradley Layton and I'm a professor at the University of Montana where I direct the Energy Technology Program. Before we get started, I want to thank you for spending time with me, Governor Bullock, and the fine folks at the Inspired Classroom and an organization known as We Are Montana in the Classroom who place University of Montana faculty members, graduate students, and professionals in K-12 classrooms statewide to inspire them about higher education and career pathways. Today, with the technology provided by VisionNet, we are able to fulfill this mission. This event is part of a national initiative called STEM Career Accelerator Day, being hosted by STEM Connector. You can find more about their organization at stemconnector.org. My first connection with STEM Connector came through as a result of a National Science Foundation grant I received through their Advanced Technology Education Division to enhance the educational opportunities for my energy technology students, a few of whom you see behind me, to strengthen our relationship with the Blackfeet Community College, to build connections with renewable energy technology companies, and to build connections with high school students around Montana and across the United States. You probably already know this, but the presentation you're about to take part in is a minds-on activity. So get comfortable in your seat, take a deep breath, and get ready to meet and interact with some of Montana's leaders in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, I'll hand it over to Governor Bullock, who would like to share with you his vision for the future of STEM education in Big Sky Country. Hi everyone, I'm Governor Steve Bullock, and I'd like to thank you for being a part of the first ever Montana STEM Fest and showing an interest in a career in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. These are some of the fastest growing career fields in the nation. In fact, over the next decade, Montana is expected to need more than 2,000 new workers a year with skills specific to these fields. And these are good paying jobs in careers such as engineering, research and technology, architecture, and health sciences. I've been working hard to ensure that students like you have access and support to succeed, which is why we've created the Governor's STEM Scholarship Program to provide financial aid to students pursuing one of these careers. We've also launched the Montana STEM Mentors Initiative to encourage more girls to pursue a career in these fields. You all will determine what the future of Montana looks like, and your participation today means that we will have a bright one. Thanks so much for being here and have a great time. Okay, everybody, thank you and welcome to SEMFest. I want to do a couple of quick introductions, and so what we're going to do is get it. This is an interactive program. Um, I can see you right now, and <laughs> just like you can see us. And so we're going to start by just asking a couple of questions, and I'm going to start with Ruben because Ruben is in the studio with me. And what I would like um, everybody to do is I would like you to First, say your name, say one great thing about where you live, and I would like you to say how you see STEM in your life in 20 years from now. <laughs> Additionally, um, we're going to ask from each of our high schools for have one representative ready to answer those same three questions. So as you're listening, go ahead and make sure that you have that representative ready and that they are ready to speak. So go ahead, Ruben. Well, I'm Ruben Darlington. Um, what was the second question? <laughs> One great thing about where you live. Oh, well, I live in uh, Missoula, Montana, and that uh, has just tremendous outdoor recreational opportunities. Perfect. And how do you see STEM in your life in 20 years? Well, 20 years, who knows? <laughs> you might be fighting off the Terminators. Perfect. All right. <laughs> Terminating. <laughs> Next, I'm going to ask Dr. Mike de Grand Prix, who is also with us um, as part of the University of Montana. So go ahead, Mike. Um, so uh, a little bit about me. Um, I studied uh, physics at the University of Montana. Um, got my degree there. I'm currently working on my master's degree. It's an interdisciplinary degree. The uh, project that I'm working on with that is to miniaturize a pH sensor um, so that uh, we can put that sensor in a lot of different places. Um, currently, our uh, sensor technology is actually pretty large, so if we can make it really small, then we can put it on like autonomous underwater vehicles and 
drifter programs and stuff like that. Um, so, um, some of the stuff that I really like to do uh, in Missoula is to uh, mountain bike, uh, hike, and go rock climbing. This picture here is from uh, uh, a lookout tower tour that uh, I did last year. Um, I don't know how to point to those pictures, actually. That's okay. If you stand to the side and point center, you'll mm -hmm. be able to do that. <laughs> All right. So. And look, there we go. We can see everybody. Wonderful. So this is a picture of me on a guardrail taking a nap uh, after about 55 miles before we start to climb up to the next lookout tower, which is on the other the other picture there. So that was a really fun day, um, or a fun trip. We did four lookout towers. So I'm a research and manufacturing engineer for uh, this company in town, um, Sunburst Sensors. And we manufacture um, autonomous instruments that measure uh, the amount of dissolved carbon dioxide in seawater and the uh, pH of seawater. They have uh, just slightly different technologies and uh, Mike will actually be talking about what what makes these things uh, tick more or less um, I can't see any of my notes no. this is kind of a basic overview of how the instruments are laid out in the top part of the of the instrument there is a, a pressure housing and so that holds all of the uh, sensitive electronics like a battery, the control board, the optical elements, and that seals them all from the um, from the seawater. So these things will go down to 1,800 feet in the sea, and uh, does that help you? <laughs> Not really. Uh, so they'll go down to 1,800 feet and just sample on their own uh, for up to a year and then record all of that data. And then people come and pick them back up. Uh, so we have these things deployed all over the world. Uh, NASA, NOAA has uh, purchased these from us. Um, tons of other uh, researchers, uh, researchers from universities all over the place. Um, I believe they've been deployed in all of the world's major, major oceans so far. Uh, so, so, after they've been out in the sea for a while, um, people go and pick them up. And this is, a, this is an example of a highly, uh, what we call a biofouling. Uh, these are like giant gooseneck barnacles all over this thing. If you look really hard, um, and and this one, uh, that one, <laughs> uh, you can see our instrument right in the, uh, the little copper in the middle of it. So these things come back with all kinds of uh, crazy stuff growing on them. Uh, in them, I found a, like a four-inch long fish inside of our reagent bag once, uh, a, like a crab all dried out in there. One time, um, for whatever reason, somebody scooped a whole bunch of this biofouling off of there, put it in a, in a plastic bag, and then shipped it back to us. <laughs> so, uh, and it was, it was the worst smelling uh, instrument I've ever dealt with. Sometimes people will just take it right out of the ocean, wrap it in a plastic bag, and send it back to us. So, we, you know, there's... There's been times where there, you, there's been maggots in there and stuff like that. That's pretty gnarly. Okay, so what I get to do at Sunburst a lot is to uh, do research and development for uh, either uh, modifications to instruments or to tr try to come up with entirely new instruments. Um, and so what I use is... Uh, uh, SOLIDWORKS as a way to, to make uh, 
really detailed computer models of parts or whole assemblies of parts, um, and that allows me to make uh, make these uh, th these kinds of uh, very detailed mechanical drawings. So that allows me to either build it myself or send it out to somebody else uh, at a machining company uh, for them to be able to machine and put it together for me. Um, here's an example of something that I had sent out. Um, and this side here is, uh, they program, program that into their uh, machining center. And that's all the tool paths that allow them to make these various cuts and substrates. Um, and then this is uh, what it turned into. So those are two LEDs shining through a, an absorbance path link. Uh, but it's an example of prototyping something to see if it can work, being able to test it in the real world and realizing that it doesn't work. And so you need to re, uh, iterate that and try something else. So uh, some of the tools that we use in our own house uh, or in, in our own company are like soldering irons. Uh, uh, this side right here with the smaller looking um, instrument is a uh, a combination a milling machine and a lathe so you can cut metal plastic um, on those and it's pretty crude pretty manual it's pretty hard to get very accurate uh, with that kind of tool but the this one is the kind that uh, they would take my mechanical drawing and punch in all the dimensions in the computer and then it would automatically uh, machine all of that itself. Um, those are pretty expensive and you need some expertise to work with that. Um, so that's why we uh, ship it out. But they can give us accurate dimensions with, within uh, plus or minus uh, like one thousandth of an inch. Um, oh, okay. So they asked us to talk about like what was your aha moment and uh, I just felt like I've never really had an aha moment more that uh, I've just always been a little curious. When I was a little kid, um, I remember hearing about uh, the Wright brothers uh, building airplanes and they were just bike mechanics and I just thought that was the kind of really cool that these random people that are like just bike mechanics be out like inspiring the whole world to uh, build airplanes. That's a pretty fascinating history with that. But um, in 96 when I was a junior in high school uh, that's when they launched the first uh, X Prize, which was a suborbital uh, space flight uh, by a commercial entity, um, and I was uh, just absolutely fascinated that people outside of, uh, say, NASA uh, would be working on spaceflight, um, and it was all of these people from all over the world, they were just random, uh, or not random, but uh, just teams put together of ordinary people. Um, and they, and they were working on something pretty amazing. So this, uh, the prize was actually announced uh, in 96 and it wasn't completed until um, 2004. Uh, and the prize was worth $10 million, uh, but they had to get 100 kilometers above the earth, get in orbit there and uh, do that twice within a week. So that took almost 10 years. Ah, so one cool thing I got to work on uh, at my company was uh, was actually an X Prize, uh, believe it or not. Um, the uh, 
the uh, Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize. Um, it was a global competition to spur innovation in uh, pH sensing technologies to help monitor uh, changing oceans due to climate change. Um, and that was a $2 million prize. Uh, and I have a, a short uh, little video about um, our company's participation in that. It's kind of it's glitchy with the PowerPoint, so we're going to switch over to... All right, here we go. I call myself an inland oceanographer because we don't have an ocean here near Montana. Here we are at Sunburst Sensors World Headquarters here in Missoula, Montana. One of the challenges of doing chemical oceanography 480 miles from the ocean is getting seawater. Last time I was in Seattle, I was out there just a family vacation, and I ended up wading out to the Puget Sound with this jug. Got my pants all wet. We are part of the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize. I'm team leader of Sunburst Sensors. Our company was founded in 1999 to study PCO2, which causes ocean acidification. We have increased CO2 in the atmosphere. It's causing a pH change in the ocean as that carbon dioxide is absorbed. The oceans are sucking up huge amounts of CO2, and as pH changes, it can disrupt the food chain. That's a very serious thing in a world where a lot of people depend on the sea for food. We developed one of the first CO2 sensors for marine use. Eight years later, we made a sensor specifically for measuring pH. This is where the magic happens. Right here is our manufacturing space. This table is sort of the center of activity in a lot of history here, just in terms of notches and cuts and drill holes. Company mascot dog. Mike and I, and Catherine, my wife and bookkeeper for Sunburst, all went to high school together. We were close friends because we're both science geeks. I was working for another instrumentation company in Seattle. Somewhat of a gamble to come back. There was only two years of funding, and if it didn't work out, then there's not a lot of mechanical engineering jobs here in Missoula, Montana. We had two children at that point and had decided that we wanted to come home to raise them. you got to roll the dice sometimes, and it worked out. The SAMI is a submersible autonomous moored instrument. SAMI pH, which is what we used in the X Prize, measures pH. We called this one the T SAMI because it's made of titanium, so it's a titanium SAMI. And we called this the I SAMI because it's inexpensive, so the inexpensive SAMI. What I really like about these is that they're so simple. The software is very easy to use, and you just put the instrument in the water, and you let it go, and you come back, and you have data. When we first started talking about doing the X Prize, I had already been working on miniaturizing the SAMI 2s and looking for a way to make it more inexpensive so that we could get it on a whole set of different platforms, not just moorings and buoys. Gotcha. I think it's great to have this competition to be able to compare, look at all of those instruments that, that are out there and see how well we're measuring pH. We're going to learn a lot from this because uh, we couldn't go out on our own and throw a SAMI down to 3,000 meters and collect data. I'm pretty excited to see what happens. I mean, right now we've got the T SAMI, our instrument going down on the rosette, and in oh, about an hour or so we'll find out if it worked. We're a small company, we're trying to do a lot. Our approach requires a diversity of talents. I mean, we have to do some electrical engineering, we have to do software, there's fluidics because we've got tiny little pump, tiny little valve, there's mechanical design and pressure housings. And for better or worse, we have more moving parts than some of the other approaches. And it all has to work by itself at depths up to 3,000 meters. Incredible pressure. Just a, the tiniest leak will destroy the instrument immediately. It's good when it comes up that you hear it ticking. That means it's working. <laughs> It hasn't leaked. And yeah, we'll see what happened there. It was not ticking when it came up, but it seemed to have run. So it's the first time it came up without ticking? Yeah, but it downloaded so it didn't flood. It must have just locked up at the last minute. So it's running now. We're a small company, and so we're competing against some teams who have a lot of resources and uh, we've made a long way. So I mean that feels good that we've proven that with just a small team that we can do something you know this big. Yeah I think so. <laughs> Excellent. So so first of all Mike tell us where you are. I'm in my lab at the University of Montana here and you can I'll, I'll show that here during my talk a little bit.
All right. Well, I'm gonna. This is gonna be a little tricky because I'm gonna be controlling his um, his slides. So bear with us. But I'll go ahead and take it away. <laughs> yeah. So hi. Um, I'm from the University of Montana, as Ali said. This picture here should have a ship on it up in the Arctic. And uh, thanks to technical difficulties, it's not showing up. But just consider this a polar bear in a snowstorm, I guess. Um, and so this does have something to do with Montana that I'll get back to later. But right, go ahead, Ali. Great. Oh. Well, let's zoom in to the University of Montana campus here. So maybe uh, I know some of you guys are from this area and also uh, from surrounding areas. But those of you who have not been to uh, Missoula, you can please come and visit our campus, which is hopefully going to show up here. Oop, you're going through these it's pretty fast. fast. <laughs> there yeah. we go. Sorry about that. Um, so the history building, I'm up over here in this lab. This is this is right here on campus here. And so I'm, I'm on the third floor here, and I can pan around a little bit, and you can see the lab. So this is just a typical uh, lab here at the University of Montana. I'm wearing these headphones because... This is, it's very loud in here. There's, there's a hood and some other pumps going and sort of like having your head in a vacuum cleaner. So uh, that's why I'm wearing the headphones. So go ahead, Ali. Yeah, so we're a small department. We have about a, a little over 100 undergraduate chemistry majors. You might not have known that. MSU seems to be more well known in terms of chemistry, but we have about 26 faculty members between the chemistry programs and the biochemistry programs. This is the class here of uh, 2014, not all of them, but a, a portion of that class, the graduating class. So we have options in, uh, oops, it'll go back, please, uh, in uh, American Chemical Society certified chemistry and also biochemistry. We also have options in environmental chemistry, forensic chemistry, and pharmaceutical chemistry. So uh, we are a small, like I said, a small department. Our undergrads get a lot of individual attention. And so come and visit us. And you can check us out there at, on Facebook or, or uh, online at that web page site. So go ahead, Ollie. So as a chemist, you can make stuff. This is one of our grad students who made a huge bunch of this organic molecule. And then you characterize it. The molecule is shown there. That's something chemists do, they make new materials. They, so they're inventors of, of, of new molecules and then things could be manufactured from those molecules, pharmaceuticals, materials, and things like that. Go ahead. And as a chemist, you can also get into chemical education, do some great demonstrations like freezing bananas and smashing them with hammers. Um, that's uh, something that uh, chemists tend to enjoy. Uh, so go ahead, Ali. And do other demonstrations as a chemical educator. You might recognize Garen Smith or G. Wiz here. He was, uh, he recently retired from our department, uh, but he would go around and do these demonstrations. And he's still doing those demonstrations throughout the state and, and all over the world as a retired emeritus professor from the University of Montana. So hopefully you can catch one of his shows if you haven't already. Go ahead. Yeah, and so chemists also use a lot of very sophisticated instrumentation. We have really state-of-the-art instrumentation here at the University of Montana in the chemistry department. This particular picture is of a X-ray diffractometer, which is the only one in this part of the United States. And so you use that to, to uh, determine the structure of, of chemical substances. And in the next slide, the, this is one of our general chemistry classrooms. We, uh, we have a lot of students in general chemistry, and as a chemistry undergrad, you would take this class. But we split into peer-led team leading groups, and I don't know if you can see the student off to the right here uh, standing up, but um, we have peer-led team leading in our chemistry undergraduate courses. So the, if, you, if you're a chemistry major and you do well in general chemistry, you can advance on to become a peer leader and actually lead instruction in these general chemistry courses. 
So lots of opportunities for teaching interfacing at the university. You go ahead. And you know what, what I really, why I got into chemistry was because I like, like I said earlier when I introduced myself, I like natural waters, lakes, rivers, the oceans. I was always fascinated by them. And an important part of that is pH. And so here's a pH scale and different colors representing that pH scale. In the middle here you have neutral pHs. And so I, and the other thing I was very interested in is the interaction of light with matter. And so light can be used to characterize matter and indicators really show that interaction by having color. And so uh, one of the things we did in our inventions that Ruben talked about was we used indicators for measuring pH and for measuring CO2 in, in seawater and other natural waters. And so the way, the way you can do that is CO2 can cause a pH change. And so hopefully you can see this purple beaker up here. And does anybody know, uh, what I want to do is change this color with CO2, because CO2 is an acidic gas. And so does anybody know of a, a source of really high concentrations of CO2 that would be handy that I could use to do this? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have a, a thought. Oh, I see somebody in the blue shirt. Ooh, I'm not sure what school that is, but yes, go ahead. Say it again. Dry ice. Oh, good guess. I don't have any dry ice with me, though, okay. right here, but what's another possibility? <laughs> Oh, he's really no I don't think they can see us. Yes, they can see us. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I see somebody, it looks like almost in a UM shirt. A grizzly shirt. Yeah. A long sleeve shirt. <laughs> yeah. You can exhale. You can exhale. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Let, let, good idea. Let's try that. Now, don't do this at home, okay? Slow going. It's clearing up. Hopefully, you can see that slowly changing yellow. It doesn't show up there very well. There we go. Okay, so this is a. That just shows that CO2 is an acidic gas. And then, because of that, and we can use indicators to monitor pH, that's how we measure. The CO2 with our instruments, we have a membrane that is between the indicator solution and the CO2 source, which is the water that we're trying to measure. CO2 can diffuse across that membrane and change the pH of the solution, changing the color, which we can then determine through a light measurement what that color is. So that's how we measure pH and CO2. We actually mix the indicator in the pH measurements. We mix the indicator directly with the water. So go ahead, Ali. And of course, like Ruben said, one of the one of the interesting twists on this whole thing was that we were able to enter this X Prize with some modified pH sensors. That's shown off to the right there. And one was more affordable than what we currently produce, and one was able to go down to deeper depths than what we currently produce. And that's what Ruben talked about. But we won both categories for those at this X Prize presentation in Washington, D.C. So uh, that's one of the things that I've been involved in lately. Another thing in the next slide, and this is where that ship, a uh, ship in the Arctic should be seen, um, but, but it's not showing up for reasons I don't understand. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, what I did, what I was really excited about lately in terms of our work in my lab here at the university is to do field work up in the Arctic. We got a National Science Foundation grant to go up into the Arctic and look at the carbon cycle CO with our CO2 and pH sensors. And we did that by deploying those sensors through the ice. So go ahead, Allie. And um, this is a, a top of the world view of the Arctic Ocean here. In the darker regions, that's the deeper water. The lighter blue regions are shallow water. And the Arctic is surrounded by Russia off to the left there. And then that's uh, Alaska, sort of in the lower right. And then Canada to the upper right. And then Europe to the north. And so those are the areas that, are, that surround the Arctic Ocean. But what's been happening, as you can see in the next slide, in the Arctic, 
is that the ice coverage in the Arctic is decreasing dramatically. And so this figure is, shows the ice coverage from 1979, that's when we first started to measure ice cover with satellites in the Arctic, down to the present time, about 2015. And so the ice has decreased by over 50% over that time period. What these, are, these measurements were made in September when the ice is at a minimum. In the top picture there, you can see the ice extent that existed back in 1984, the top picture here. And then in, you know, off to the right, the mouse. But, and then in the lower figure, the lower right figure, that's in 2012. That's a ice, when the, that was the lowest ice year. That's shown in this low peak on the figure on the left, the very lowest peak, the low dip there. That's the 2012 data. So the Arctic is changing rapidly. The ice is declining. And that affects a lot of different things. You've probably heard about the polar bears and the walruses and things like that that are being affected. But it also affects weather patterns in Montana even. The jet stream varies a lot more significantly than it used to because of open water in the Arctic that lasts throughout a lot of the summer and it changes the weather patterns throughout the year as a consequence. Go ahead. So what we did is we deployed our sensors through the ice on this, I can't see if you guys can see this on the left here. Um, the image is sort of clipped off in my screen. Can you see that, Ellie, on the left? I can see it, yep, we can see that. Okay, okay. so what we did, and this is my technician, Corey Beatty. He's worked for me for 16 years. He's a, got his bachelor's degree in, in biology, but I hired him a long time ago to help me out with this field work. So he's a guy who got his bachelor's degree from the University of Montana and does field work all over, all over the world. And so he, here he is in the Arctic deploying one of our SAMI sensors. Uh, these are the sensors. I'll show you a close-up. You can hopefully see the heart of this sensor right there um, in that figure. So you can see the insides of the sensor part. That's the part that detects carbon dioxide in this case. So we deployed those through the ice in the Arctic so we could look at the carbon cycle in the Arctic because you could imagine with the ice changing in the Arctic how that would change the carbon cycle because the carbon cycle is dependent on things like photosynthesis of organisms. And when you have no ice there, there's the potential to really radically change the photosynthesis and biological production of the Arctic Ocean. So that's why we're up there studying the Arctic. Go ahead. And hopefully this video will work. So this is, the guy over here has a gun because polar bears can uh, come out of nowhere on, this, on the ice pack in the Arctic. Here we're putting some equipment on the uh, surface of the ice that we're going to set up with the SAMIs. So they just use an ice auger there to uh, make a and that, right, that's Mike, not, yeah. Just really quickly, um, we're, we're getting close to the end of time, and I want to leave some time for some questions for the students. So um, I yeah, don't want to cut you time. off, but perfect. <laughs> Just a little warning. <laughs> yeah, so these are, these are data that we collected. Um, on the, we deployed two systems, one in the ice and one in open water. And this data is shown up here in the uh, Arctic Ocean where we studied it. These are CO2 levels at, with different colors. The red is higher CO2 and the blue is lower CO2. So go ahead in the next slide. So not to uh, throw a bunch of data at you, but we get a lot of data like this. And our goal then when we get data like this, this is a CO2 up here, oxygen down here, and ice coverage. The idea then is to interpret what all that data means. And so that's, that's one of my main objectives is to interpret data and then try to understand what how nature controls these important variables. Okay. All right. Oops. There we go. 
Yeah, and so this is the map that Ruben showed. This is where our sensors, and so we've already seen this. We can go on. And so my, uh, all of the students all have this information in their packets as well. So just as Yeah, this is just, I just want to point out, though, this, there's our Facebook, that's our Facebook page. Check it out. Come and visit us if you're interested. In any program at the university, we can help you out. My email is right there, too. Any questions? Yeah, let's go ahead and open this up to questions real quick, and we'll start. Um, <laughs> it looks like you have somebody that's excited to call you. So come on in, um, Ruben. And we're gonna go. We're gonna go through schools. So let's go ahead and start with Big Sky. Big Sky, do you have some questions for either uh, Dr. Mike de Grandpre or for Ruben Darlington? Any questions? I have a question. Do the University of Montana chemistry students work with you on your data analysis, or do, do the team of professors do the data analysis? Uh, we have a lot of undergraduate researchers here in my lab. I, I have two now, but I had four over the summer, and they get involved in all aspects of the research. I have uh, a lot of them do lab work, though, because I want them to get uh, lab experience. Um, and, but then when the, they collect data, they also interpret those data. So uh, lots of re undergraduate research at the University of Montana in the chemistry department here. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Let's see, other questions. Let's go to Belgrade. Is Belgrade with us? <laughs> you guys get a question. You guys got it. How far down um, can you get when you're collecting data with that ice drill? Oh, Ice auger. Oh, well, so the, the ice, uh, that's on the surface of the ocean there. It's just a couple of meters thick. And so you, uh, at most, so you only have a, uh, you have the ice auger, and you can actually get pretty long lengths of, of auger, up about two or three meters of, of length of the auger to go down through the ice. They generally pick a place in the ice that's not super thick. Otherwise, it's too difficult to get through it. Wonderful. And then the Let's instruments see. are lower down through there. Let's see. Do we have Sentinel with us today? Sentinel, you are. Okay, Sentinel. Okay. Now you can say something. You guys have any questions? Oh, Quinn. I guess not. <laughs> All right. No worries. Let's see. Is Great Falls with us still? I think they may have. They may have had some difficulties. How about? Um, let's see. We heard from Big Sky. Well, let's just do this. If anybody else has a question, since I can see all of you, how about you raise your hand? Yes, absolutely. Blue shirt. Have you guys ever seen polar bears while you're deploying those? Yeah, well, um, not while we were deploying them, but while the ice was going, while the ship was going through the ice, we saw lots of polar bears. And I have some photos of them. I had um, pretty good shots of the bears. Um, in the place where these sensors were deployed, it was so far north that the bears don't usually go up that far up. And nowadays, because the ice is so far away from shore that these bears can no longer get to the ice pack. It's too far away. Can, um, that's why they're. That's why the polar bears are on land, going. Can we have a sign uh, that it's a cell phone. Going around on land these days. I hope that answered your question. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> oh, Ali. Yes. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Do you have REU programs so students can go out in the field with you? Yeah, we have a REU program, a NSF sponsored REU program for summer research at the university. Uh, that's for undergraduate chemistry majors. 
Um, we just we just had six students this summer involved in that. We also have internships. We do a lot of internships at the state crime lab here, here in the, from the chemistry department and the other industries like Rivertop Renewable have internships. At those companies and our company mm -hmm. Sunburst Sensors as well has internships. Lots of opportunities. Nice, thank you. All right, any last minute questions for um, either Dr. Mike DeGrand Pre or Ruben Darlington?